Lastly, coming, we'll talk about uh, some of the biggest real estate uh, investing mistakes to avoid uh, from our years of experience um, or different perspectives. Right? Making mistakes. Yeah, making mistakes so that you don't, hopefully, at least don't make the same ones. Okay, so yeah, we're going to touch on yeah, a, a brief number of, of mistakes that, uh, that, are, that are commonly made. Uh, this is one... I feel like this, I kind of have to touch on this one because it happens often enough is, is I'm going to go full time as a real estate investor. So I'm going to, and, and, and I get this, I've gotten this probably a hundred times since I, since I became a mortgage broker and mainly because I deal, I'm an investor and I focus with real estate investors. Somebody calls me and say, Hey, I heard you're great with investors. I just quit my job to become a full-time real estate investor. So now that you know how serious I am about it, how many houses can I get? And, you know, it's funny to those of us who know, like, well, that's, you know, the answer is zero. You don't have any income. You can't qualify. And um, it doesn't, it, from, from one perspective, people can have a lot of cash. There's a lot of reasons why people think they can qualify. They've, they've got enough cash put down. So they're going to, you know, not foreclose on it. And we are really limited in residential real estate underwriting to, uh, to how much income we have. So there are, uh, even if somebody's got past income, I started like that. I had a really good past. I was early 20s. I had uh, a lot of cash because I'd sold a couple of businesses. My historic income was good. I had perfect credit, but I, had, I didn't have a current job. And my, what I realized, my past, my past you know, income it became useless the second I, I, don't, I don't have it anymore. So there are some caveats. So we're going to have joint venture partners. Um, those are a lot more challenging. Everyone thinks they have a joint venture partner until the joint venture partner has to actually sign an application. And then the joint venture partner disappears. So it's one of those things that I, if you have somebody that says they're going to invest with you, like often they'll say, hey, yeah, bring me a deal. I'll invest with you. Well, I mean, if the deal's good enough, I'll invest with you. I don't even need to know your name. <laughs> like if the deal's good enough, I'll invest with you. But barring that, uh, typically what happens is people say, well, okay, uh, they look at it and think, okay, well, this is an average real estate investment. And they're just not willing to actually uh, commit to signing their name uh, and, and signing a personal guarantee in some cases to actually joint venture with you. Um, the, the, number one, uh, the number one thing I recommend if you, if you want to be a full-time real estate investor and don't want to have a job is to have rich parents. And those are now at 20, it starts to get hard to get adopted. So either have that or you don't. Uh, but even with rich parents, you want to make sure that they could still qualify because sometimes you have really wealthy parents, but they still, they've stopped working because they don't need to work anymore. And sometimes they'll say they'll help and uh, kind of the same thing. As soon as they have to fill out an application, they start to ask a lot more questions. So again, the caveat is just, just continue to ask questions, engage a joint venture partner or your parents or your brother uh, about those types of things. There are scenarios where you've got two incomes in a household and, and one income is sufficient with your debt load to be able to qualify it. In that case, you can, you can look at being a full-time real estate investor because you still have an income. Um, or often someone will want to flip properties for a while, they do private financing, typical, typical rules don't apply. And if you have contract type income, sometimes you can stop working for a few months and then go back to working. Nurses are a perfect example of this because a nurse can always find a job relatively quickly making good money. So they might be able to take three months off in a year and still have a really good annual income. Uh, or contract work um, can kind of be the same. If you, if you work uh, as a contractor doing subcontract work, sometimes you can do the same thing where you can take some time off or people in the trades can often do the same thing. Uh, one thing that I will say is if you are planning on quitting your job, even under the circumstances that we discussed here, whatever, whatever your circumstance, maximize everything possible for it before you quit. So maximize your line of credits on your existing properties. Do whatever you can with the income that you have prior to quitting your job. That means personal lines of credit. That means everything you can think of that you can qualify for. Uh, do it before making a change in your income. Because then you, once, once you get a line of credit, they're not going to take it away. Even if they find out you quit your job, as long as you don't miss payments on it, they're going to continue to allow you to have that line of credit, whether it's secured or even unsecured. So this is a, a big one. And uh, you know, I made money, so my strategy works. So I made a whole bunch of money in real estate. Um, and, 
And this one, this one's, this one's a, a really big one. I can give you a whole bunch of different examples in a bunch of different ways. But just because the strategy that you employed or what you did worked doesn't necessarily mean that you've that it's a good strategy, even if you've made lots of money doing it. And this is something, the first time I saw this was in 2008, 2009, is in 2006, seven, the market was booming in Calgary. So I've seen this cycle a few times. And what was happening back then is, you know, somebody would buy a house, put in some new flooring, new paint, new baseboards, sell it a year later, $50,000. House number two, basically the same thing, new flooring, new paint, new baseboards, six months later made 60,000. Third house, same thing, new flooring, new paint, new baseboards, sold it five months later. So now it's like, oh, I'm doing it five, I can do two a year, make 60,000. Uh, if, if I just do four a year, I'm gonna make way more money than I'm gonna make at my job and quit their job. And I saw a lot of people do that in 2007, eight, right? Then, you know, that's after the, they realized what investing geniuses they are. So then what happened, 2008, nine rolls around, quit their job, bought two houses, new flooring, new paint, new baseboards, listed them, didn't sell. Okay, well, it's just waiting a little bit, a little blip in the market. Uh, you know, month two update, dropped my prices 20 grand. People just don't get how valuable these houses are. I don't know why, not selling. Month four, got a new realtor. My realtor obviously just got too lazy. He's been making too much money off me. Month five, switch back. My other realtor wasn't bad. The new one sucked worse. Uh, month number seven, I can't sell even at a break even. So now I'm stuck renting these out at break even or in some cases a loss. And I saw this play out many times. The ones that were doing high-end flips, which are sexier and more fun, which we'll get to later, um, those are the ones that actually lost money. I did see people that were, I saw two people actually hit um, a millionaire kind of status uh, in like 2008, nine or seven, eight, let's say. And then within two years, one of them had gone bankrupt and the other one, I remember sitting with him, he's still a good friend to this day. We were sitting in a pub and I just refinanced this house. And back when you could refinance up to basically 100% financing. So he had refinanced his house and had nothing. And he's like, yeah, I'm, he's like, my net worth is, is, is about five grand. I have $5,000 in the bank right now. And you know, my house is worth exactly what, what I, what the mortgage is on it. And he went to zero. So he was, he basically had no net worth, no anything. So he went for a million. So he did, he didn't miss a payment anywhere, but went to zero. The other person actually went bankrupt. So lost all their money and then, and then also ruined their credit. Um, so this is actually something that we often see. And it's, it's a, it's a very easy example of what often happens. So one of the biggest mistakes we as real estate investors make is ignoring the market's role in the profit that we make. So that can lead us to double down or embrace a strategy that isn't actually a good strategy because we're making profit and we're ignoring how we're getting to that strategy. Conversely, it can actually make us discard a good strategy that isn't making us what we're hoping it could make because we're actually in a down market. The strategy is sound, but we're in a down market. So we're ignoring what's actually happening in comparison to the market. So the way to do that is to really kind of ignore, to, to really see what your strategy is doing. And once you've sold or you get to a, part where, a point where you're finished and you're either refinancing or reevaluating what you did, you just have to compare what the market would have done had you done nothing. So whether your energy is actually adding to the value of the property. So this is um, another way to look at it. So if you buy a $600,000 house, and you have a $50,000, you do a $50,000 renovation, and it's worth 700, you made $50,000, right? Your, your work made $50,000, well, that's at least what you think. So you've made $50,000 though, either way. So you're making money, you're putting it in your pocket. So that's a good year. Um, but let's just take a look at that under two different market scenarios. So in market scenario number one, the market was dead flat during whatever time period you did those renovations in. So that means you actually made the $50,000. So you put in 50 and it made you 100. So there was a profit or an increase in value that you added through your efforts that gave you a $50,000 lift. Now market scenario number two, the market increased $60,000. So the renovations you did, the work you did actually lost you $10,000. So because you've got, you know, $60,000 was the market, you put in another 50, you're in for 110 plus 600, it should be 710 even just as a break even. And those two market scenarios, in both cases, 
you're taking fifty thousand dollars but you really still it, and it doesn't mean that's not a this is a good thing but you still need to be aware of what part of the uh what part of these you know the efforts that you're putting in are actually doing in comparison to the market and and it's actually okay market scenario number two i've definitely done that way more than number one i've been a market that's been outside the last few years been relatively flat with a few ups and uh, ups and downs but when i buy a property i buy to hold forever so i'll go put i'll go do grading around the house because i don't ever want water penetration in my house and then i'll make sure i redo my downspouts and sometimes that means i have to redo the gutters even though there's nothing really wrong with them but Tenants will invariably take the, you know, the downspouts that flip down and up so you can mow the lawn under them. Well, a tenant will flip them up if they're having a barbecue or mowing the lawn, and that's where they'll stay for the duration of the tenancy. And you stop by, you tell them to put them down. They just, they just don't. Right? So that's why I run around. Um, and every time it rains, I go around, I check my properties, and then I check Anthony's two that are right next door to me. He moved way south. So, um, and that's basically what I have to do because I know that that's going to happen. So one of the things that I do in most of my properties now, I don't have to check because I have the downspouts going to the fence. That cost me money. So I have to redo sometimes the fence and then have the downspouts go over to the fences and then down so, um, so nobody can move them. They're actually secured, they go over top and they go to the street or the alley. And so I'll do grading, I'll do that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll take the, the fence next to the garage and I'll move it up to the fr front of the garage so that there's two parking spots next door. Then I get some grading and some gravel put in and all that stuff. So that's $15,000 worth of stuff that I'll do, plus reuse some gates and fences, um, stuff that doesn't really add value to the property. So an appraiser wouldn't give me more value for it. So I can't refinance that out. And if I was selling it, nobody's going to pay more because, oh, it looks like the downspouts are routed better and nobody pays for good grading. But as a real estate investor, I know that I don't want to go into my house five years after I bought it in a rainstorm and go, why does it smell so musty down here? Because then you know you've got a problem somewhere, but you can't even tell where it is. So that stuff I'll do. So I'm okay losing $10,000 with my efforts because I know the value it's going to add for me down the road. So, but it's just being aware still of what you're doing and how you're adding value and does it actually work with what you're with with what you're doing and again really just making sure that you're not um thinking that your strategy is doing well because the market happens to be booming um <clears throat> so there's i did a presentation mostly you'll get this and, and why it's insane at least if you've lived in in calgary for any length of time uh and if you're smart real estate investors uh, it's, so I went to a presentation of somebody who has uh, really good systems in the mortgage, he's a mortgage broker, uh, works out of Vancouver, has really good systems as a, as a mortgage broker. So I was, I was, he was part of a, a conference we were at, did a, did a bit of a presentation. And at the end of it, he starts talking about how you should invest in real estate because you know, as mortgage brokers, we don't have, uh, uh, you know, we don't have pensions or anything like that. And it's like, okay, well, preacher into the choir. A lot of people are ignoring them. And I'm like, oh, I'm just interested. I'm still paying attention to what he's doing. And he said, yeah, I've got, I've got eight houses now. I'm going to buy a few more this year and I'm planning to buy a couple more. And I said, you know, what kind of properties do you buy in Vancouver? I'm curious to see, because I know how expensive it is. And I know the rents don't necessarily match the double prices. Um, the rents are more there, but not double. So, when I, when I asked me, he said, oh, I just buy single family houses. Uh, it's just, just easier. I buy new single family houses. And, 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 I, and I said, well, you know, how does, how, does the, how, does, how does the cash flow work on single family? Is that actually a good cash? It's like, well, no, no, I lose, yeah, I lose about $800 a month. But, but that's okay. Because basically every couple of years, uh, I just refinance one of my properties because they're all going up. So I might lose $10,000 a year in cash flow. But they're going up thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year, so it just makes sense. And uh, so, so it's okay that I'm losing money monthly on these houses because they're going up so much in value every year. And you know, I asked, him, "Well, what happens if that stops?" He's like, "Well, it won't stop." Um, but I was kind of waiting as in his presentation, like, "Where's the punchline?" And then it's and he, and he just left it there. It's okay that I'm losing ten thousand dollars a year because they're going up in value, and I can just refinance it to cover the payments. And I was waiting for him to be like, I'm just joking, that would be stupid. And that never came. He just, and I'm like, did he get interrupted? Did he forget? Uh, what's that? So I went and talked to him after, and I just was chatting with him. I was like, yeah, but, you know, how's, how's the real estate? Everything's good. You know, what happens if the market stops going up? Well, even if it just flattens out, like you're just going to be feeding these properties. And he said, well, 
you know, that won't, that won't happen. It's Vancouver, prices always go up. And it's something that, that we understand here, but it's unique to understand that there's a, you know, a 20 year period where Toronto and Vancouver, they have seen nothing but excessive increases in real estate prices and rents for 20 years. There's a whole generation of uh, realtors, financial professionals, investors that have never seen their their version of a market downturn is when the their you know two quarters in a row go by where they don't have you know ten thousand dollars added to the prop the value of the property like that's their that's as bad as it ever gets and even now they look at this and think oh that's that's that that market is um, uh, the market is just temporary as soon as rates come down one quarter everything's going to boom again and. Uh, but, but that is how they understand things. So not only is this person losing money on, on all those properties, but also continuing to leverage them up. So the, the increasing leverage, and he always, also always advocated for variable rates only because you're going to refinance them in two or three years with all the extra equity you have anyways. Uh, so of course, when market rates went up, I, have, I, don't, I don't know him well enough to call him and ask him how he's doing, but he would have had a, his $10,000 kind of loss would have turned very quickly into a $30,000 per property loss times, I'm not sure how many properties he was up to, but even if he had 10, which he might've had more by that time, based on what he was saying he wanted to do, but 10 properties losing $30,000 a month, $360,000 a year, and he can no longer refinance that out of the properties because there's no, uh, there's no, there's no equity left. So, uh, he, but but when he was talking to me, and I was talking about, well, what if these things could happen? And he kind of looked at me like, look, I'm the one that's made millions off of real estate investing. You aren't. So don't don't question me. Right. And, and it's kind of like and it's like and I didn't because that's true. It's hard to question somebody to be like, hey, you're, I know you're making money, but it's kind of stupid. You're taking a risk. Um, but that is something that we need to be aware of that we're not doing, too, is that looking at um, uh, looking at like what our strategy is doing compared to the market. And right now we're in a booming market. Um, and obviously we want to take advantage of it, make as much money as we can in every way we can, but we do have to ensure that we're accounting for the market in whatever it is that we're doing that's making profit. So we don't get caught out on a limb, uh, you know, with three properties we're flipping, thinking that we're geniuses in the renovations that we do and that's what's adding the value. Uh, boring is sexy, so you can only you can only be sexy once. In this is any kind of investing, for the most part, with a few very very few exceptions of people that are exceptional. But um, you can have a real estate uh, sexy real estate investment or a sexy financial statement, but you can rarely have both. So flipping high end houses in Martaloop is sexier than a house with a basement suite in Haysboro, and it gives you. But what gives you the longer term investment? Which one is more susceptible to a market downturn? which will eventually happen. Um, and, you know, building infills is sexier. This happened a lot in 2006 and between 2012 and 14, everybody became an infill builder. And this became something that, you know, the tearing down the, you know, the old bungalow, replacing it with the two side by sides. Um, and those people ended up getting caught with properties that were terrible rentals in private finance rates. And as the market sunk, they ended up actually up, not just upside down in terms of they've lost their profit, but, and, and even what they had put in, they were underwater, so they couldn't sell it and pay off the mortgage. They would ha had to feed it in order to do that. So um, we saw that happen too. Um, but again, the boring strategy is sometimes the sexy one. And this, if you can, if you can go and, you know, think about, are you going to bring your friends by or if you're bring a girl by if you're or a guy by and to be like, hey, look at this cool investment I have. And you've got this uh, house, $2 million house that you're renovating and it's got a, you know, a water, you know, a, like a <laughs> TV that comes down from the ceiling and a skylight that opens up like it's the back cave. And it, that's cool. You're going to you're going to want to show your friends that investment because it's really cool. But you're not going to want to. Hey, look, you should see this property you should look at the grading around this property i have in haysboro no matter how much it rains no water is getting in my basement and uh, look at the parking there's lots of parking tenants are never going to fight about parking this is awesome um but but again i'd you can have you can build up 20 houses in haysboro renting for cash flow and sustain any kind of market 
down or up. It's going to make a ton of money for you when the market's going up, like it has with anyone with that structure in the last few years has made a ton of money. But if the market goes down, okay, well, I just have to wait a little bit longer. But the strategy, I'm still whole. But if you're in the middle of a bunch of high-end flips and the market goes down, you're taking losses. You, you have to absorb those losses. Uh, this applies to a lot of different businesses. Uh, gyms, restaurants, uh, bars, even subsets. If you look at restaurants, for example, um, would you rather own the char bar, the, you know, the one in the Simmons building? You know, it's really cool building like who wouldn't like to own that and have their friends stop by as they're showing the minister of finance to their table and shaking hands and recommending dishes to cool people that come in or would you rather own three tim hortons and work in the back of them when it's like oh there's somebody called in sick today i'll go throw on an apron you'd be like if your friends from high school came in, you'd be like, oh, God, I actually own this. They probably think I'm working here. And it would just be a different feeling. Still kind of one's sexy, one's not. But if you own three Tim Hortons, which one is more likely to be around in five or 10 years? Charbar or three Tim Hortons? We all know the Tim Hortons are all going to be there unless they happen to change locations across the street, but through their own choice. But the Charbar, statistically, probably not going to be there, at least under the same ownership. Um, so aim for having a sexy lifestyle, traveling to Paris, wintering in Argentina, um, but not sexy real estate investments. Of course, exceptions to everything. That's certainly my feeling is that people get too excited about something they can show off about in real estate. Um, make your real estate boring. Um, too hyped on flipping. These are kind of honorable mentions, things I want to touch on briefly, but I'm, I'm not, we just don't have time to get into all of them. Um, people love flipping but it gives you, you higher taxes. So uh, you have to pay full, full, full income taxes. Even with the increase to two thirds taxes, uh, that is still two thirds, you pay two thirds of your top tax rate. So you're still paying less, even with the increase. Um, it used to be half of what you typically pay on taxes for capital gains when you eventually sell. But really when you're buying to hold, you buy and you refinance and you access the money, but you don't pay any taxes on it until someday you sell. Um, so you can use the government's money effectively for decades. Um, so, uh, and then you have to pay at any kind of increase you pay, you also just, you, you pay immediately. Um, and then there's just the, as already mentioned, you're at risk of market fluctuations. Um, if there's a downturn and you're flipping, you have to absorb that loss, you have to eat it. If you're buying to hold, you just write it out a little bit longer. You don't have to actually absorb any losses or change your strategy. Um, not having an exit strategy, if you flip, um, what happens if things don't go well? Again, high end, can't rent it out. Flip properties that could be potentially good rental properties or at least break even properties in the event that you have to carry it for a couple of years. And this one, the third one under that point, how to handle the whole portfolio with different market scenarios. That one's tough. So that would be the example of, you know, somebody looking at buying a bunch of single family homes in Vancouver, making cash flow when the market's booming versus a bunch of you know that same strategy and, and you know buying a buy and hold houses with basement suites in calgary what happens if the market changes so for us the market changes you know that boring strategy actually makes and lifts up everybody's net worth uh but that's it but if the reverse happens in the in the booming market scenario where you're losing money on cash flow uh it could be disastrous somebody who's spent you know, 15 years building up a big portfolio can lose it all at once if the market turns. So look at from a whole perspective, not as an individual property or one strategy, but as a whole, what you're doing, what different impacts, what, you know, different markets, the impact of different markets would have on your whole portfolio, your whole strategy. And most of all, can you survive if, if the worst thing happens? Uh, overestimating and underestimating timelines. Uh, we, we kind of overestimate what we want to do in the next two years. Everyone wants to buy 10 houses in the next two years. I've never seen somebody start and buy 10 houses in two years. I shouldn't say never. It's just very, very rare uh, under a few circumstances. Um, the way I typically do, you know, plan out your next few purchases and definitely from a financing perspective, continue to think about all the next steps. But... Um, you know, take like one of the things is, uh, you know, Warren Buffett style that you like, I remember buying and holding it in not a great time. And it's still, I just kept buying a property when I could, you know, even after 2009, 10, I'd, I'd only had a couple of properties during the boom. 
And then I just kept buying properties when I could. I could buy one more, boring, not making a ton of money on it. Just kind of started doing it as more of a habit. And then I woke up one day or just started paying attention one day and I separate all my bank accounts instead of, and I always like to have $10,000 in there. So I'd either do that by refinancing or we'd have to put money in with joint venture partners, whatever, $10,000, just a cushion, a few months rent, a few months, you know, incidentals for every property. And all of a sudden I started looking and I had between 30 and 40 and $50,000 in all these accounts. I'm like, well, rents have been going up. I've been maximizing rents. And I just, I had hundreds of thousands of dollars to go buy more property. And it just all of a sudden really started snowballing. So, uh, you know, 2012, 13, 14, I was able to buy a lot of properties. Of course, the market then crashed again, but luckily, I long, you know, I, I buy for cash flow. So I was able to wait until, uh, until a few years ago when, you know, things really started paying off. Um, this was Anthony now, so I'll hand this off to him to see if he can touch on a few. Yeah. So to touch on Lane's points, you know, one big mistake that we see a lot, uh, especially in a market like now where the interest rates are a little bit higher. Uh, I mean, it's improving a little bit now, but the, the rents took some time to catch up, right, to those higher rates, is people will find a way to make the numbers work. And at the end of the day, if a property doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? Um, sometimes it's the marketing material that does that. Sometimes it's the investors. Like a few examples, right? Like you might have a property that's like, on paper, going to be negative 150 bucks a month, right? And then you start to look at your performer and you're like, you know what, insurance is not going to be that high. You know what, vacancy right now is not that high. I'll, I'll knock that down to zero. Um, maybe I can shave a little bit here. And then you start to massage those numbers. And then you end up with something that works on paper, but then real life comes in and your assumption were probably right in the beginning, right? So that can be a huge mistake long term, right? Uh, another one would be um, in kind of making the numbers work is ignoring the market forces that are likely to happen, right? Um, so the reverse of what we're having right now is a few years back, we had really cheap interest rates, right? So properties that made sense at 1.5%, 2% interest rates, today they don't make necessarily a lot of sense, at least from a cash flow perspective, but there's a lot of investors that use those rates to benchmark their investment and decided, I'll be fine. I've got an extra 50 bucks a month or hundred bucks or whatever it is. And now we're upside down if they're renewing mortgages, right? So yeah, don't force the numbers to work. If they don't work, they don't work. If you've got a certain strategy, a certain buy box, um, now you have to be flexible within that, but you know, don't try to fool yourself. So next thing, tax stuff. This is more of an issue, I think, for first time investors. Uh, I think most investors that have a few properties understand a little bit better um, you know, to go to a professional to get your taxes done. Uh, yes, you can file your tax yourself, especially if it's personal taxes and it's not in a corporation, but it's really easy to miss on some small things that over time become bigger things, uh, especially when it comes to capitalizing assets, things like that, or renovations. Um, a big one I see a lot is spending money to save taxes. That, that's probably, I don't know, Lane, you, I'm sure you hear that almost every day, right? Uh, <laughs> It's kind of silly when you really think about it, but it seems to make sense at face value. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to pay too much on taxes. You're like, well, you know, this is a tax write-off, so I'll spend a little more on that. I'll do some extra I so I don't pay tax. At the end of the day, you're still paying for that stuff. The reason it's tax write-off is you're not making money, right? The reason it's a tax write-off is you're lowering your profit. So don't spend just to get the tax return. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, now on that same line, it's not necessarily a mistake, but it's something I kind of want to touch on is some people think that by flooring and expenses themselves instead of the tenant, they're saving on tax. It's not the case. A common one is utilities. Um, whether you pay, let's say the property costs you 300 a month for utilities for easy numbers, right? Whether you pay that 300 or the tenant pays the 300, and you charge, you know, rent adjust for it. So let's say 1300 utilities included or thousand bucks without utilities. It's the same thing, right? There's no extra tax saving because you're paying it. Changes nothing, right? And last one, now, I'm not an accountant, right? All of this are my opinions, uh, but 
if you have a very long-term investment, like let's say you plan to hold for 20, 30 years, for some reason, there's some accountants that um, suggest you shouldn't claim CCA, which is the capital cost allowance. I mean, it's a personal decision, but my opinion on this is that if you're gonna hold it for long enough, yes, you have to pay it back when you sell, but you can make a return on that money while you hold it. And yes, it might push you in a higher tax bracket than 30 years from now, right? But if you have all that time to use that money and invest it and get you know, the average return that most investors here are gonna get, you can make a much bigger return. It's essentially an interest-free loan that you're getting in that time period, right? Um, so yeah, that's the other stuff for tax. Um, hiring the cheapest trade. So I'll hand it off to Santosh in a sec, but I wanna share a quick story on this because I've been there, all three of us have been there, especially when it's your first property, you wanna keep costs low, which is good, it makes sense. So you go shopping around, you have some renovations to do, some paint to do or whatever, and you're like, you just try to find the cheapest guy, right? You're like, how much are you charging me for this? Oh, I, 40 bucks, 40 bucks an hour too expensive. Right? I can find a guy for 20, right? And you keep shopping around. You're like, you're my guy. You're the cheapest. Hire that person. Then that reno that's supposed to take two months takes five months. And you start to realize, and, and then you find out you have to redo a bunch of the work and you start to realize that cheap trade's not that cheap. So, um, so I have a story around this um, and Santos will cover more obviously on this slide, but uh, um, I hired a painter on one of my first renovation. Again, did that same thing, right? Shopped around. Um, most people were quoting me prices per square feet. I was doing the math. I'm like, oh, this is, this is thousands of dollars. That, that, that can't be, right? Um, then I found one guy, 20 bucks an hour. And I start to do the math. I'm like, oh, it's gonna be like a few hundred dollars to paint this whole main floor, right? I'm like, you're my guy, come in. First day I show up, all the supplies were bought from Dolorama, all of them like roller, paintbrush, like everything. Um, the guy was smoking in the house <laughs> as, as he was starting the reno. And I knew it was not gonna go well. And after he was done a paint job, I just had to hire another painter to start over. It, it was so bad, there was just no, no point, right? So did I save money? Not really, but it's very easy to fall in that trap. So, so yeah, I'll let uh, Santos talk more about that. Good trades do cost money. Um, and this is a pretty good chart. Some of you might have come across this. Good, fast, and cheap, so pick two of it, right? So if you want fast and good, then it's probably not gonna be cheap. And if you want it fast and cheap, then it's probably not good. It's gonna be similar to what Anthony experienced, okay? So when it comes to trade, um, I think the, the best way to go about it is ask for recommendations from people, right? Um, it's, it is hard to find good trades, um, and you do have to pay for them, right? Good, good trades um, do charge uh, what they're worth, but it's worth the money often. Um, so yeah, quality workmanship pays off in the durability and longevity of the project, especially if they do a good job and you don't have to redo it. That's cost savings right there. So um, I just put this picture in because Anthony actually bought a property <laughs> recently in, in Southwood uh, where the seller had did a paint job, I think. I don't know who did it, but all the outlets were painted like that, so I figured I'd throw this in. So, so the, the, the next point I wanted to cover is uh, people not doing the due diligence that they're supposed to do or getting too emotional. Um, and we do see this from time to time because um, the market is pretty hot. When properties do come on, they also sell just as quickly. Um, so what our advice is to be prepared and not get caught up in emotions. Like, okay, a property across across from where you live came up great location you know the area very well very convenient but does it make sense from an investment standpoint right is it overpriced is it going to go into a bidding war and it does it also need a new roof window so x and y at the same time and does it make sense just because it's right across from you or it's in the same neighborhood right so you have to weigh those weigh those options um Always when you look at properties on the market, factor in all these big ticket item costs, whether they've been done or not, just account for, the, account for those, right? Um, and always have a price ceiling in your head. Like, okay, there's, there's gonna be multiple offers, which is often the case now, right? Um, so make sure you have your price ceiling set, 
Like, okay, I'm willing to go up to 600,000 for this place, right? I'm going to offer 550, but I'm willing to go up to six. Have that in your mind and then be ready to go up to that ceiling and not more than that, right? That way you don't end up, you know, overspending. You don't get buyer's remorse after that. Um, another thing that I also wanted to touch on, kind of on the same point, um, mistakes that people do is tenant screening, right? Especially for newer investors or newer landlords, um, you will find that a lot of tenants have beautiful, elaborate stories that they will tell you when they come in about, you know, how they had to rescue six puppies from being euthanized and you will be the savior where they will house the animals. Um, well, that's great. You probably want to weigh the, the, the risk of taking on such tenants, right? So be very careful with tenant screening because one bad tenant can cost you thousands, um, especially if they end up trashing the place, right? So um, don't get too emotional, essentially the, the moral of the story. And fact check everything. Exactly, yeah. So whatever story to tell you, make sure it's true. Yep. Yeah, do, do your background checks, credit checks. You know, if you have to call employers, call them, verify. If you have to call their um, previous landlords, it's, it's often better to call the previous, previous landlord because if they are a bad tenant, the previous landlord probably just wants them out, right? So call the previous, previous landlord. Uh, and often if you do a credit check, you should have a pretty good idea of where they lived two places ago because it kind of shows their address history on that, so. Okay. And the next thing is being overly cautious. So just like people who are reckless and maybe don't do the due diligence, we also have people who are overly cautious, overly worried. Everything is doom and gloom. And they overestimate and assume the worst case scenario for everything. So when you run your numbers on a property, be realistic with the expenses. Yes, sometimes you can have stuff that costs more than you anticipated, but don't over budget for it. So for example, we like to use $200 a month for a single family home, an older property as your repair and maintenance budget. Um, now we have some clients who budget like, well, what if the furnace breaks now? I'm gonna budget like $500 a month, right? And by doing that, yes, it makes you feel good because yeah, you, you've got, kind of covered everything. But you can turn almost any good deal into a bad one because if you overestimate every single number, yes, it will be a bad deal, right? So you have to understand the fundamentals and the intricacies of the property, right? How much economic life is left in the various components and budget accordingly. Uh, and if you're not sure, ask your power team or ask us what's a reasonable estimate, right? Um, because often we find that if people overestimate, they also kind of freak themselves out and to them, everything looks like a bad deal, right? Next one would be not doing routine inspections. So a lot of you probably have tenant occupied properties. So failing to do inspections is a common real estate investing mistake that people make, including myself. I've been there, done that, learned my lesson and I'm better about that now. <laughs> Um, so these routine inspections gives you, give you an opportunity to identify and fix problems before they become a real, real serious problem. So I'll give you an example. Um, now I go into my properties at least every four to six months. I try to get in there just to have a look at everything. I go to all the rooms, check under the sinks, check under the, I flush the toilet, make sure it's not running, um, things like that. But on one particular property, I let it slip because I was like, ah, oh, the tenant's paying on time. You know, he's really good. He tells me about everything. And turns out that one of the toilets were loose, right? So the toilet was rocking from side to side, but the toilet worked. It flushed, right? So the tenant never told me about it, that, that it was an issue. And a few months later, the basement tenant calls me. He was like, hey, there's like you know, kind of mold growing in the ceiling. And I was like, hmm, that's kind of strange. So... Turns out I went to the basement, I called a plumber out, they cut the ceiling, found out that the toilet has been leaking sewage into the basement ceiling, right? So this is something where you can avoid, a situation you can avoid by doing a routine inspection. Because now I had to call in a mold remediation company to kind of cut out everything, replace the plywood, and there was tile on the, on the upper floor. I had to break up all the tile and redo the whole thing. So it was a, it was a big ordeal. So... 
have a checklist essentially and go through it each time you go and do your routine inspection. So like for example, in my case, just tightening down the toilet would have been a really simple fix, but because I let it slip, it was like, it cost a couple thousand dollars to fix that. Right? Um, so yeah, loose toilets, leaking drain under your kitchen sinks, silicone around your tub, check all the ceilings, smoke detectors. Tenants often like to remove smoke detectors, um, especially if they tend to go off frequently. Um, you find that smoke detectors are often removed. Um, always make sure your tenants have those installed at all times. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about all we wanted to cover today. Is there any questions? Yeah. Um, ladies, you said that you had ten thousand dollars in an account for a property. Is yeah, this is how I managed it. Like, what's your recommendation for a property for the amount of money that you should be holding? Um, also, kind of personal, depending on what kind of lines credit you have. But I just I did that. Partially because a lot of the properties, especially like my first few were joint ventures, then I bought a bunch of my own and I still have one, like, so it's like half and half for me. So for my joint venture properties, I always wanted to have that. Uh, theoretically, it, you could just have one account for all the properties, at least, you know, for each ownership group, so to speak. Um, and because I, I certainly don't need 10,000, like if you have one property, $10,000 is probably not enough almost. Um, it'll cover incidentals, so you gotta make sure you have more than that and, you know, credit and everything else. But once you once you have, you know, if you got 10 properties with $10,000, then you have $100,000, it's kind of less likely that you're gonna have a whole bunch of roofs go at the same time and a whole bunch of, so you can, in some ways you need, you know, more for some reasons, like overall portfolio risk, and it's not something you could personally handle the same way, but you're less likely to need it for repairs. You're not gonna go, if you have one house, you're gonna, it's possible, you're gonna be fully vacant for a couple of months. Bad tenant, wreck some stuff, you gotta go in, or just eventually you gotta do some renovations and replies, so you've gotta not only pay for the replies or, or, or uh, repairs, but that you have the, you, you're gonna be vacant for a while, so you're making the mortgage payments, tax, all that kind of stuff yourself. Um, you're not gonna do that on all your properties at once. So you could be 100% vacant, if somebody leaves halfway through November, can't get a rent in December. You can't like it's it just it's, so sometimes there are challenges like that. Um, but you're not going to be 100% vacant when you have you know 10 properties with two units each. So in some ways, so you got to kind of weigh it against your own you know personal comfort level. I'm extra cautious, um, which does allow me to be more aggressive in my investing because I know. I've got a lot of backup upon backup in terms of like, I've got cash in each account for incidentals. Something major happens, I've got enough credit available, I've got lines of credit on each of the houses. And as I get more, I also find that I'm less comfortable of fully leveraging to 80% on everything. My first few properties, yeah, I leveraged right up because I wanted to buy more properties. But at a, at a certain point, you get to the point where you don't want to have that much leverage because um, you personally can't kind of just make up for it if things go wrong. If you got one or two houses, use your personal income to cut some costs, use your personal income. Uh, but it- Yeah, if you have to you cover get. 500 yeah. bucks a month, you'll be yeah, fine. Exactly. But if you have, you know, you cover 50 of those, then you're- yeah. a year. Yeah. You cover your 10 rental properties in uh, Vancouver, using 30 grand a, a year. That starts to become a little more challenging to just, you know, ah, I'll just cut back on going out for dinner. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that kind of thing is, um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit personal, but I mean, I'd be uncomfortable not having at least $10,000 per property. Having said that, if I had six or seven properties and I was managing with one account in my QuickBooks, for example, then, you know, I might be okay with just having 50 in there because it's unlikely I'm gonna need it all at once. I'm not gonna need all the vacancies, but those are also the accounts that I, that I have for my security deposits and those types of things too, right? Because like, Included in that is actually security deposits, so it's not even all mine. Yeah. So sometimes I actually have seven there, but the next time it's going to come and be a security deposit too. So, um, so I, I like to keep ten at least, um, and that's just my rule. But I mean, you can weigh that against your own kind of other investments or other. Like if you got a stock portfolio with a few hundred grand in it, then who cares? That like then you've got other liquidity that you can access. Uh, in the event that something went wrong. Part of the reason I like 10 per property is because outside of anything big, it makes my accounting easier. 
air, most things that come up, if I need a new set of appliances, and I got to pay a repair guy to go do something, I can, I can just use the account. Yeah. Even a roof, like I can usually just, I can, you know, roofs are getting to the point where they're 10,000, but um, uh, not quite yet. So it's like, even when a roof comes up, I, I've got the ability to, uh, to just pay for it, so. What do you do with the surplus, like profits per a property? So like, if you're cash flowing a thousand dollars or whatever, for yeah. like in profit, you hit the 10,000, what do you do with that excess money? Uh, well, it's kind of a minimum for me, but if I get enough that I'm, I'm say, look at buying another property, then I would actually go in and then I would, but I would never go in and pull out more than that left me 10,000, that didn't leave me at least 10,000 per property. So I would go in and say, okay, I've got 30 in this account, 26 in this one, and I would just pull out everything over 10, mm -hmm. say, okay, now I've got $150,000 down. So it, it just stays in those accounts usually. So you don't move it into like any like investment accounts or anything? You just let it sit there? Not really. Like, it's yeah. not, for me, it's not worth the paperwork. Um, I mean, for 10 grand, the whole point is that it's supposed to be very liquid, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have to actually move it from an account to a different account, it's not really... Because, I, I mean, the other thing is it's kind of an overdraft account as well. Right. If you get a big big bill coming in, then you know you're not getting hit with like a not sufficient fund or something. Yeah. It's kind of really just a floating account. But uh, and like like Lane said, a, a chunk of it is your security deposits, and those are supposed to stay. Um, I mean, technically an interest bearing account, but that can be a savings account, right? Yeah. So, and, but like you're saying, like at at some point, like you know, when it, when it hit me, when I was like, oh, I got like an extra two hundred grand here that I can use, like it, that was. That was kind of like, it's, you know, I theoretically could have made some money on that, investing it somewhere else too. But again, I also weigh my time and <laughs> um, time in terms of like managing that from right from the accounting standpoint of it to everything else to um, moving it around to make it a little bit higher interest rate in a different type of account. I could buy a GIC, but then what if a great property comes up the next day then I'm locked in for a year or six months or something else. So, so I'm. So I usually just, I, I, I like to be very liquid um, and that enables me to make very quick decisions on investments um, because I just know I, I can waive my financing for example, I don't need financing for example, because I ha I know that I've got enough liquidity that if I needed to close, I could close with either cash or a combination of you know cash and some short-term private funds until I work some numbers around. Um, so I happen to, as a real estate investor, I like to be pretty liquid. So um, I'm just okay if there's too much money in that account because eventually I know I'm going to use it. Um, and I, you know, if I knew for sure it was going to sit there for years, then I, I have certainly taken that and invested it in uh, private mix. I've, let, I've done my own personal private mortgages for people that are flipping houses. So I do that when it gets to be too much. Um, uh, and then, but then I count those things as you know, kind of not liquid but pseudo liquid money that I can that I know I have access to. Um, but I just can't get it tomorrow. Any other questions? Um, yep. I have a question. And this could be like this question on the preference for everybody, but um, like you, you've been talking uh, about like basement suite, houses and all. Um, what do you think is, uh, like in your opinion, is a better investment? Like buying a one house, which is like with a basement suite, 700K, but, or is it better to buy like three condos? <laughs> I think all three of us yeah. will tell you the house with the basement suite. Yeah, here. yeah, and, and, and it's aggressively so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so the question, just to, just in case anyone didn't hear, it, is you know, yeah, would you buy you know a seven hundred thousand dollar house with a, a, a you know a basement suite or seven fifty even versus three condos for the same price? Um, I mean, I, I, I think that we had a, a short that went viral. Because and it was just me saying I hate condos, <laughs> like, and condos. So condos, you don't number one, you don't own the land. You actually, I mean, you own a fractional share of the land, but you own very little land in portion of what you're buying. So you buy a five hundred thousand dollar condo, you're buying, you know, a, a thirty five thousand dollar your share of the, what the land. It's not like you can do anything with that either, building. right? Yeah. Like so, yeah. And, and the building it goes, goes down in value, which is why we can actually depreciate or use capital cost allowance. Is depreciating the value of the structure because it is getting less valuable. The land itself is actually going up. So land is a part of real estate that goes up and down. Adjusted for inflation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you might yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the condos, I mean, sometimes it's easier for management. Yeah. But outside of that, you're, you're paying for the, you're paying someone else in condo fees to do the management and then you're actually overpaying them to do the management. Um, and then as Anthony alluded to, you can't, it's already at highest and best use. No matter what you do to your condo, it's not going to be more, you can increase the value of it a little bit, but very, very little. Uh, and what will happen over time is the, as the building gets older and older, and there's not much land to kind of offset that value of loss, is it will manifest itself in higher condo fees. So you're gonna have to pay higher and higher condo fees. And I've seen people have bought you know, properties that are like, oh, we find these 1950s buildings, they're super, super cheap. He eventually got to the point where he paid off all of his mortgages and he still couldn't cash flow. He had no mortgages, couldn't cash flow because the condo fees in the building were higher than what he could get for rent. These are down. Like condo fees and expenses, yeah. right? So just, yeah. Uh, because you guys, uh, for sure, have a lot of experience, uh, things like it. But someone who's just starting out, of course, like I cannot afford to buy a 700k house. Like I cannot qualify for that much. Can you do the rich parents thing? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I'm joking. Yeah. Uh, so you know, like for me to save that much, like I like I graduated from university two years ago. Like for me to save that much money, it's gonna be like gonna take yeah. a while yeah. so isn't yeah. it better for like someone like me to have like you know 50 or 60k and just buy a condo in the meanwhile well you like, don't have to buy a condo the more affordable option would be a semi-detached property and you could house hack right so you could live in one unit and you could rent out the basement suite to offset the costs you could live there for a year or two and then save up and repeat that to the on to the next property and then turn the first one into a rental right but you and know even the semi is kind of like to me the yeah they're, they're not cheap yeah. they're not cheap but they're they're also like not townhouses with no condo yeah. fees. or at least, well those are almost as expensive as semi detached in a lot yeah. of cases um the downside of the townhouse with no condo fees is when they're brand new it's actually a decent option mm -hmm. but as they get older because there's no central management of the exteriors you often end up in situations where the owners are not really taking the same care between units and as they age that problem becomes worse and worse so now as one owner that doesn't you know redo their exterior they don't put the new fence and then it kind of drags down the it's whole building over time window syndrome right why mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's like a bylaw you can't have a broken front window because the second somebody starts doing that and it's especially to a townhouse somebody doesn't fix mow their lawn, then the next door neighbor's like, well, no matter how much I mow my lawn, it just looks stupid anyways, because the dandelions are this high next door. And, and, then and that can happen in neighborhoods of single family houses, but it's a more, it happens faster in that type of properties. It, it's almost um, inevitable. Like yeah, it, is, it like happens every time. Gonna have, because everybody's condensed, as soon as one person gets lazy, then the next <laughs> somebody else does, and then it just becomes where it's too late. And, and, you, and a lot of times too, like, you know, Santosh was talking about house hacking, in terms of payments, a semi-detached with a basement suite that you're living in is going to cost you less a lot of times than buying a condo but for yourself. Like they're so, not in like, you know, like in downtown, like those, like neighborhoods are like... Which kind are you referring to? Sorry, on, what's the... Like in this the, with the basement suite, right? Like so, they're in like, you know, more... I, I, I'm just yeah. curious, uh, yeah. just as a, a just wondering, uh, or have you been in Calgary for a while or are you moving from somewhere else? No, I moved from Saskatoon, but I've been living here for two years. Oh, yeah. Because okay. uh, one thing we found with our tenants long term is you don't need to be downtown um, at all to attract like good tenants. You, you need to be close to... Myself. Oh, for yourself. Want, yeah, yeah. I obviously, so right. obviously the, all we're talking about is as a pure investment, right? Mm -hmm. um, like condos are not a terrible type of property to live in. Right, there's a lot of benefits, and the one you mentioned is the biggest by far. Right, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to live downtown, if you want to live even not just downtown but in a more expensive neighborhood, it's often the only affordable option. Right, uh, there's a lot of neighborhoods even outside of downtown that it's million dollar homes, but you can still get the condo for maybe three or four hundred thousand. So it's a good option as a homeowner, um, but it's not a great option as an investment. It's not terrible. Like if you're gonna invest in nothing in a lot of time, uh, in most cases, you're still better to buy a condo. Mm -hmm. But if you have other options, like you, like you mentioned, right? Is it better to buy three condos mm -hmm. or one single family house? Mm -hmm. It's better to buy the one single family house. And, and that's for Calgary, right? Different markets, different situations. Yeah, for your- What's the simple answer for why? From the, 
like why 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 one has versus three common? Because the the land appreciates so much fast. So if you like tear down a um, okay, so let's say you go to Highland Park. Just I just I just know that neighborhood. So so it's it's on Fortieth Avenue, Center Street, in the north. So there's six thousand square foot lots, and, and and often what's happening is you know people tear down the old bungalow and they put up two infills, and it's all for eight hundred per site um, or semi detached. So if you buy uh, a condo for three hundred, and the market goes up. 10% you make 30 grand, just the general market. Uh, if you buy the house, the bungalow for 650 grand in Highland Park or 600 grand, it goes up, uh, it doesn't go up 60. What it actually goes up is, is the end value of what the builder is going to buy. So it'll go up, you know, right now it'd be like 160. And the reason why is because the builder looks at what he's going to sell both units for 800 grand aside. And then he has to minus his build cost, cost off that the margin that he wants to make profit, and that's what he can pay for the land. So when it goes up 10%, 100, he can pay 160 more uh, thousand more for it to make the same amount of profit. So that's one example of how land, the, the value of land, change of use, and appreciation accelerates a lot faster. In the short term, not necessarily. It and that's in redevelopment values. neighborhood, right? So it doesn't apply to everything, but essentially mm -hmm. end up stacking the market appreciation on top of the change of use of that property. But even if you're talking about the neighborhood that doesn't have redevelopment at all, right? Um, you still get less risk from the freehold property because you get more control on what you can do, right? That condo, like we alluded earlier, you might be able to do renovations on the interior, which helps, but you have zero control on the building, right? You have zero control on the condo fee. As that condo fee goes up, the condo becomes less attractive for buyers, right? Um, where with that single, um, single family home, you can make changes to curb appeal. You can make changes to the type of rentals you're doing, right? Um, let's say you're in a downturn market or, or just the cash flow is harder. You could decide to do medium term rentals. You could do short term rentals. You could add units, right? If it's a new one unit, you could add a basement suite. Uh, you could add a garage, rent the garage. Like you get options and you don't need to use those options, but having them really de-risk your investment a lot mm -hmm. where Again, with the condo, you're more limited. So it's more about having the options. Like the more options, the better in, in these kind of situations. Um, and then and there's the, the appreciation piece, right? Um, yes, you might get hit with repairs, but you know you get more of that control of how you're maintaining that unit. So it, it, do we have any what, what other? What I will say though is that the condo rents have gone up substantially in Calgary For sure, over yeah. the last little while, like far more than anything else on average. So um, those numbers are probably looking more like it well, used to prices be. Well, prices have too. Yeah. So. But it, like it, in comparison, you used to be able to take a single family, you know, like we could take that comparison and do, you know, buy, you know, two condos or one house and hands down the condo or the, the, the single family house would be a way better cash flow. Or now I, I have done those numbers, but I, I suspect they're a lot closer than they used to be. Yeah, that's, that's one of the biggest thing with the cash flow. Like, it's, you know, like, because condos are, like, they're smaller properties, they get rented really fast, and, you know, like, there's more cash flow. Well, actually, well, the cash yeah. flow is w significantly worse on condos than it is yeah. uh, on two units, like, significantly, even on a smaller one. The problem is the rent you can generate for one unit, it's really difficult to make the numbers work. With the current interest rate, you need two units in most cases to cash flow. Um, and in terms of rentability, I mean, obviously there's personal preferences, right? But you actually have a lot of competition with condo because you're also competing with purpose-built rentals. And often those purpose-built rentals are identical, right? The apartment buildings are identical if they're in the same neighborhood, where if you've got single family homes, usually it depends where you buy, but usually you have less supply competing with you. Because often you're competing with homeowners, right? Not everyone's renting out their house. Um, so it's not necessarily more rentable because it's a condo or, or more affordable, smaller unit. Uh, but this makes me think of a common um, mistake that people make as well is if you look at appreciation right now for condos, it's very strong. It's the strongest appreciating asset type. Second one is townhouses. And that's because of the rising interest rates, right? It's an affordability driven appreciation. But that's a small snapshot in time. If you look at the last 15, 20 years, that's not how it tracks, right? Um, 
So make sure when you look at those kind of appreciation and you compare assets, you look at longer time period, not like a two, three year time period. Uh, it's valid for neighborhoods as well, right? Right now there's some neighborhoods that are appreciating really fast that historically are not doing that. Um, so yeah, no yeah and I have one comment to like, uh, because I mean, I was a student for a long time, so yeah. depending on the situation too, for example, she, she wants to find a place to live, she could it, like, if she wants to, like, let's suppose a rent by room or something, right? Like, you could uh, get an entry point, like, three bedrooms, one bath, rent the other two, kind of house hack in there. Mm -hmm. So I think you're still going to win if then you wait to save that bigger down payment or something, or be able to qualify by hopping jobs, like, in five years or six years. So I don't know, like, what you guys think. Well, I mean, to your point, yeah. sometimes it is better to wait a little bit to buy something. Um, again, like I said, buying something is better than nothing, as long as it doesn't yeah. bankrupt you. But is it better to wait an extra year to get something better? Probably. Yeah, well, I mean, one concern that I think we, we all share is there's a lot of condos being built right now. And right now there's a shortage of inventory, so it doesn't really matter. But in a few years when all this supply comes to market and you've like hundreds of identical units like downtown, then we could see rents uh, take a hit because of that, right? Longer vacancies turn over. When in a cyclical market like yeah. Alberta, condos always come in line when you don't want them to yeah. because the, the building cycle is pretty long. And by the time that there's demand to build them, and by the time they're actually coming in line, they're often coming in line when the markets either balance or soften a little bit. Too late often. Yeah, it's often yeah, yeah, a little they, too they late. They only stop building them. They, they only stop starting build, start to build them when they you know, when the market turns and it's bad and there's too many then they stop building but they got to finish up four years of starts yeah. and that's what, and then it's like okay well it's already bad it's already bad and then it just we still have years of, of of continuing uh, you know new condos and units coming online that's so, why if you look at uh, historical trends especially with uh, boom and bus cycles in calgary the condos always drop first and they recover yeah. last and this boom was true of that as well, um, or, or this price growth. Uh, condos dropped first, a last downturn, and now they're re they're doing really, really well, but they're they're lagging behind uh, other asset types in the recovery. So, uh, so I think we'll wrap it up.